Yeah, so the next hot or cold question is Chris Ballard will survive the season, but not Frank Reich. Um, and I think that's a cold take because I think they're both gone after this season. Um, yeah. or maybe even sooner, depending on how these next couple of games go. Um, you know, or at least you'd like to think that if the Colts are truly in their Super Bowl or bust window like their owner seems to say they are all the time. I like Ballard and Reich, uh, but I just, but man, I'm just mentally exhausted. I can't do this anymore where we get hyped up every year, get talked about, you know, the, well, obviously the organization isn't going to be like, you know what guys, I think our team's pretty mid. Uh, we're going to go uh, eight and eight this season. Um, so be on the lookout for that. I, I get that part of it, but at the same time, I mean, win now takes risks and the Colts have simply refused to take risks and that falls squarely on Ballard. Um, I mean, so much, you know, as much as I love Ballard, uh, I think he has to go. And I think if Ballard goes, it only makes sense to get rid of Reich too. So the new GM can get their guy. Um, because I mean, to, to come into the season, like, okay, fine. You know, we, we thought we were a, you know, quarterback, away from being good, but why are we not putting other pieces around that quarterback to be good? Why are we going into the season with Michael Pittman? And that's pretty much it, you know, with, uh, you know, and you're taking a bunch of untested rookies, which I mean, like I said, they're all, they're all starting to it come happens. around a bit, but you know, why have we, why did we not go and, and look at getting, you know, some upgrades at the wide receiver position? Why didn't we go, uh, why didn't we shore up that offensive line, uh, to make sure we could protect Matt Ryan. Why are we, if we're saying, okay, you know, why why does this team and organization just seem to think like, okay, anything bad that happens, it's the quarterback. The rest of this team is flawless. The quarterback is the only concern. It's like, no, it's not, that's not how this works. You know, you have to put talent around him at wide receiver. You have to, you know, even if it's just to get the pressure off Jonathan Taylor, because I mean, you, you saw, you've, You've seen it in games where teams are like just saying like, yeah, fine. We know you like beyond running it with Jonathan Taylor, you got nothing. Um, and so it's it's frustrating that this team every year is like we're we're going to be in it, we're going to be you know in contention, and it just doesn't get reflected on the field. And you know, you mentioned it, the fact that you know we've thrown a lot of money at that offensive line, and this was kind of Ballard's calling card that like, oh hey, we're going to build in the trenches. Well, guess what? The trenches look like crap right now. Um, and defensively, I think they look okay. Yeah. Okay. Defensive I like trenches. Our defensive are, line. Yeah. Yeah. Defensive line is solid, but uh, as far as the offensive line, I mean, okay, fine. If you're if you're if you're gonna tell me that you're gonna build in the trenches and that's truly the, like one of the only things that matters, then why does it not look better? Why are we not taking more care of it to make sure that it's better? So. Ballard, I think, is a gr is great as a talent evaluator. I'm not ready to, you know, I I think he, I will, to this day will still defend him as a better GM um, than Ryan Grigson, but it's just I I can't do this anymore. Of yeah, we're fine, we're good, we're gonna be we're gonna be okay, and it's like no, we're not, man. We, we, it's been so it's been it's been so mediocre for the last couple of years now, and and, it, and if we're truly in that window, we need to actually. Be proactive, take some risks, and yeah, fine. If you know, if there's egg on your face after a four, you know, twelve and one season because you went out and signed, you know, OBJ to spice up the wide receiver core and that didn't work out, well then fine. At least you went for it. I can I can be okay with it as long as you're taking swings. You're gonna miss sometimes. That's why I mean I'm a huge Cubs fan. Uh, you know, as, as everybody that listens to the podcast knows, like I because Theo Epstein, you know, had some good. You know, he took some swings and and he connected on a lot of them, going out and getting Aroldis Chapman, going out and getting John Lester, and he missed on some, getting you know Alex Avila and, and Jose Quintana, who didn't look uh, the greatest um, in their runs with the Cubs. So I mean, it's it's okay once you've built up that equity to take some chances, and they just refuse to do that while at the same time being like, we're fine, we're good. Like, no, it's not been good. It's not been fine through the first you know five weeks of the season. As far as the plan for the future. I think these next uh, couple of games are crucial. Uh, the Colts need to beat the Jags and Titans both. I think if if Frank Reich and Chris Ballard are going to make it through this season, they those they need, the Col the Cubs need to be sorry the Colts need to be four two and one after after week seven. 
they need to be four two and one. If they're you know if they lose to the Titans or lose to the Jaguars or lose to both of them, especially if they lose to both of them, you're the season is it's going to be really tough to rally. You're and not make the, making the playoffs, right? Well, you're you're, not. Well, you're definitely you're over in the division, <laughs> right? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're definitely not winning the AFC South. There's a chance you could rally at the end of the year, you know, and put some wins together and get in as a wild card team as the seventh seed potentially. Uh, but then it's another one and done. And then what does that really get you? Um, so yeah. um, I think they need to win both of those games. And if they don't, that's when the changes need to happen. Fire Ballard and Reich. Uh, you know, Luke Diamond, a uh, Colts podcaster on Twitter, I saw him say make the switch. To, and, of course, you said earlier, make the switch to Sam Ellinger, uh, which I agree with. Uh, put yourself in a position to figure out your future because, essentially, you're going to be looking at your future if you go 0-2 on these next two games. So um, I think they need to win both of those games. Uh, obviously, if they don't win both of those games, it's going to be time to just, you know, peel it back, figure out what you have, start rebuilding this team because it's clearly not in the position that we once thought it was. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think they're both gone at the by the end of the season or at the at the end of the season if not earlier. Look. Yeah, the, we have there's issues with Frank Reich. He his in-game decision making isn't always great, but He's one of those guys that I feel like he is struggling with the cards that he's been dealt. You know, you can only if you can only do so much, and you used your one wild card on getting Carson the team Wentz. to buy on on Carson Wentz. Yeah. So that 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 doesn't that doesn't help. But Chris Ballard, I, you're right. He's a he's good at a talent evaluator, as as anybody out there. He's a great scout. However, this whole thing with being stingy with your cap space, look, congratulations. I, I, yeah, you got a ton of cap space, <laughs> but that, that doesn't win you games. That doesn't win championships. I know you don't want to buy a championship. I get that. I get that you do not want to go out and spend A-level money on B-level talent. And I'm, I'm A-okay with that. There is nothing wrong with that at all. However, where he has failed this team time and time again, in the article that I sent you, I cannot remember who wrote that article. I think it was Sports Illustrated, Yeah, I actually. So. But where Chris Ballard has failed the Colts is that he has not handled the signing of players for the back end of the roster. There is zero depth. He talks about building it in the trenches, making the trenches better. The offensive line depth is awful there is a considerable drop off from high level talent guys to i mean usually you can say oh there's a drop off from the starters to the backups but these guys that they brought in for pennies on the dollar like matt Pryor, look they were worth pennies on the dollar because they you know for a reason right these guys were bar in sitting in the the walmart dollar dvd bin for a reason um which, by the way, you can find some really good hidden <laughs> gems <Right. laughs> in that bin, which is, which is great. You, if you can find those gems, if you're willing to go digging through it, you can find them. But he hasn't, and he hasn't put in the time to go out and get those types of players that can help on the back end of the roster. The, the example the writer used was when the Buffalo Bills drafted Josh Allen, they had an awful offensive line. They knew they weren't, they didn't want to go out and just spend a ton of money to, with band aids, but they knew they didn't want that to be a long term solution. But they knew they needed to do something now to improve it while the back end talent, the rookies, progressed. And they went out and they made some key signings on the offensive line of veteran players. Yeah, they may have overpaid a little bit on some of the guys, but they had a considerable increase. And well, their their offensive line played considerably better the following season. And as those guys aged, the guys on the back end were getting better and getting more experience, getting more practice time, getting coached up, and they were able to slide right in when these other guys were no were you know were either became free agents or retired, and it has turned into the Buffalo Bills having one of the better offensive lines. 
this is where Ballard has just he's he's he he hasn't even stepped he steps up to the plate, but he doesn't even take a swing. <laughs> Or actually, I don't even think he stepped up to the plate on it. To be honest, I think he's like, he you know he keeps stepping out of the batter's box and taking practice swings. I, but I, I saw a video of on TikTok of Marcus Simeon, the uh, second baseman for the Rangers, and he's just kind of chilling in the dugout, and then like realizes as they're announcing his name that he was supposed to be on deck. Uh, that's what Chris Ballard is. That's Chris Ballard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, like now you're fighting for your job, and it's like, oh well, you know. But I, but it is. It's when you are when you look at your roster and you go, I'm fine with this, and you go and you you're rolling out a player like Ashton Doolin at wide receiver as your number two or number three, whatever he is, wide receiver. It's it's concerning, like. You you sometimes you have to spend the money. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to. We get it. You don't want to. You don't want to overpay for somebody. We all understand that. But it, it, there's such a thing as trying to make a smart signing and just not making a signing at all. And honestly, I feel like the Colts need to change at GM now because everybody in the in the league knows Chris Ballard is a tightwad. You know, he's not willing to shell out for the talent. He's going to come in with a low ball offer. And these agents aren't willing to play ball with that. They're like, no, you're not even going to look at the Colts because you're not going to get an offer that's worth your time. So it's it's time for a change because now you're you're gonna you have that mark on you as they're they're too cheap. Don't even consider them. So talent goes elsewhere. Because of the stigma that the Colts are cheap, I mean, you've got to remember. Yes, it's one thing to ha- to stick within your budget, you know, be smart about your finances. But at the same time, these guys are also it's their livelihoods as well, and they want to make money. And I, like I said, I totally agree with not oversigning for players that have bust written all over them a little bit, and being hesitant. But it's another thing to completely sit out free agency pretty much all together and wait for the bargain bin guys to come crawling to you. It, it, you can't, you can't be su- sustainable like that. You can't win championships like that. You got to be willing to take risks. Yeah. And then they just absolutely don't do that. And that's, what's frustrating. Cause like I said, I'm fine with it. If the Colts, if like at the end of this year, you know, the Colts, let's say they end up finishing, you know, let's say they had signed OBJ. Let's say, let's say they brought him in. Oh, he's um, they're not because he's put out his top five, right? Um, but let's say they had brought him in, and the Colts like they're on pace right now to go eight, eight and one. Let's say that's how they how it goes. They miss the playoffs again. I'm fine. I, I mean, I'm not fine with that in the moment, but but I look back on it and I'm like, okay, you know what? At least we at least we got you know some talent for Matt Ryan. It didn't work out. That's fine. But when, yeah, like when it goes bad this year and you're like, well, of course it went bad because we, there's, there's nothing. (laughs) There's, there's nothing. You started a left tackle that nobody else wants because he can't block to save his life. And now you're like, oh, we got some injuries. So let's move over to right tackle and put a unproven rookie at left tackle. Oh, great. It got worse. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) Do I think Bernard Raymond is going to eventually get there? I I, I don't know. I hope so. He cleaned I it up so. after after the, it was a horrendous start, but he did clean it up as the game went yes. on. I I think he can get there, but whoever thought going into the season with Matt Pryor as your starting left tackle, look on the offensive line. Yeah, everybody says center is the cornerstone. It is. It is. It's really it's important, but that blind side or that left tackle. That is, if you do not have a solid left tackle, the entire the rest of the line is is working to pick up the slack from that. And I think that's why we're seeing a drop off from Quentin Nelson this year, is because he is having to work doubly hard in making up for the deficiencies at left tackle, mm-hmm. and that's, which is unfortunate because everybody's like, "Look, why'd you overpay for Quentin Nelson?" Quentin Nelson's worth the money he's getting. 
It's just he's being put into a position right now that is unsustainable. Yeah, you're not going to perform up to your abilities because you're having to cover for somebody else. It's just like in any workplace. If you have a, a teammate that you're, you work with and they're not holding up their end of the deal with the daily work, your work's going to suffer because you're trying to do the job of two people. Right. It, it you know, it's like any workplace. So I'm not, I'm not jumping on that bandwagon of we overpaid I mean, the pe- Nelson and now look at him. The people that hold uh, that opinion are also the people that think Ryan Grigson was a better GM. There is a better GM than Chris Ballard because he took Andrew Luck, which we've, we've covered you know, extensively on the Andrew podcast. Fell into his lap. Right, exactly. We've covered that extensively on the show that like, look, I could have been the GM right. that, <laughs> knew that taking Andrew Luck was the right decision. And I mean, you can't, and I yeah. don't even think you can make the argument. Well, maybe he would have taken, you know, RG three, he could have messed it up that way. It's like, well, both are out of the league right now. So, I mean, I don't think so, either of them, I don't think either of them really counts as uh, you, you get credit for. Um, right. But but to say, like, quit, all Quentin, Quentin Nelson does is a uh, mean mug and growl. That, that is, which is somebody, which is somebody said on Twitter, um, has de- that's how they describe Quentin Nelson. I'm like, look, mm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not jumping on that one yet because the guy is having to make up for the deficiencies at left tackle, and he's have also having to play the the left guard position as well. It's yeah. And also, I will say, I don't know, maybe because it's a little bit of the Homer in me, but Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet just bashing on Danny Pinter, like, oh, great, look, now the Dan- now Danny Pinter is at center. Look, I thought Danny, I think Danny Pinter is actually a better center than he is a guard. And when he stepped in for Ryan Kelly last year, I was really happy with his performance. So. I was, but of course, that also might be the homer in me because Danny <laughs> Pinter is a Ball State guy, and I yeah. really like seeing him succeed. But yeah, the offensive line is. I think honestly, if the offensive line was better, if there was more investment at left tackle, or just a slight investment, you know, there was there was guys out there that they could have brought in some veteran guys that yeah, they may be a, a little bit step slower, but they can't be as bad as Matt Pryor. Mm-hmm. They just can't. And that's, yeah, and that's, that's why I feel bad for Quentin Nelson is that he, he's, tr- he's playing hard, but he's also having to essentially play two positions yeah. at once. It's rough. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it, uh, hopefully it gets better. We're hoping, we're hoping it gets better and hopefully it gets better this next weekend. We're uh, going to, you know, final question of the podcast here. The Colts will beat Jacksonville this weekend, and I actually do think it is a hot take. With as much trouble as the Colts have had in Jacksonville, the Jags have had just as much trouble in Indy. Uh, Jags have lost eight of the last nine at Lucas Oil. Uh, The Colts have 10 days to prepare, and hopefully they'll be healthy, ready to go, and I think they get the win. So uh, I do think it's, you know, this this is the week it kind of has to turn around, and and I'm hoping, maybe it's blind faith, but I I think the Colts can can get it done. I'm honestly going to say this is a cold take. Because one, I don't know if Jonathan Taylor's playing this weekend. True. But two, with as bad as the offensive line has been, um, oh, the its name's not is his name Josh Allen? Yeah. As well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Josh Allen is gonna have another heyday. He is a he's good. Okay. Yeah, he plays for the Jaguars, but man, is he good? And I think he's gonna feast. You know, whether he lines up to the left or to the right, he's got clean pickings of Matt Ryan. And if Matt Ryan cannot hold on to the football as he's getting hit, or if these wide receivers can't get open quickly enough. And then also look, Naheem Hines, is is he he's is he still in concussion protocol? That was an ugly hit. Mm-hmm. Like good thing the Colts did, they acted swiftly. They acted with the right, they made the right moves, took his helmet away quickly because that could have been a, a seriously, a, a major PR nightmare with him standing up and like, Oh my gosh, wobbling the way he did. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be some talent. That's not going to be on the field. And you're also going up against one of the better edge rushers in the league. I hope they win. I just, I'm not confident 
that the offensive line is going to be able to hold up enough for the Colts to be able to move the ball consistently to beat Jacksonville. Do I think they're going to get shut out? No, I don't think they get shut out, but it's going to be a rough day. Yeah. And then if that happens, we might see what we've talked about get put into motion finally. Uh, so we'll- if, yeah, if they lose this weekend, I don't, I don't see a path for them. I don't see them winning in Tennessee. You know, that's another place they've struggled at. Yeah. But I, I mean, if they lose this weekend, that basically puts them 0-5 in the division. You're already in a bad division. The AFC is a little bit stronger this year. I mean, the AFC Central has has some team has a couple teams that could be contending for a wild card. The AFC West, obviously, we we know they're strong. It's I mean, I'm thinking the AFC North. Yeah. Yeah. AFC North. AFC Central yeah, hasn't existed about. since uh, 2001, yeah. but I mean, I'm, I know what you meant. Thinking, <laughs> yeah. With Cleveland. Well, and all hey, that. I wish, but, I wish it was the AFC Central. Cause if that was the case, Tennessee wouldn't be in our division. So, <laughs> so yeah, they, we'd be in the, of course but that means we'd be in the East with the, the Patriots and the bills and, and, and that wouldn't be fun. Uh, yeah. Either, again, there's, I mean, look, you, you're going to have, you have Miami and Buffalo that are, you know, both going to be postseason contenders. And aren't the Jets like above five hundred now? The, so uh, <laughs> the Jets actually look like they have a pulse. Right. So you go zero and five in the division. I don't see a clear path for the Colts to make the playoffs. Yeah, I don't. I think if you lose these next two games, I think you do see a move made going into, or at least when's the bye week. My week is late in the season, and that's what I was just getting ready to say is that you kind of have there's two kind of like exit ramps that you would like nor that you normally see something happen uh, before the end of the season. Typically, it's in the bye week because you've got extra time, and it's you know after a Thursday night game because you have you know the ten days. I understand why a move was. I know there were some people who wanted to see a move like immediately, despite what happened, uh, you know, on Thursday. But I know why they didn't because you literally have the two most important games of your season coming up. So if you right. if you tell your team before those two important games, like nah, actually we uh, we're gonna stink this year. Let's just let's just po- phone it in and see what we have. Then that's not a great message. So I see why they didn't do that. And they're like, okay, let's just let's play these next two games. If we look good, we look good. If we don't, then that's when we make our changes. So but- and at the same time, I I don't feel like the Colts will make an in season change. Because you always have to have you have to have somebody on that coaching staff that you can trust to take over as interim head coach. I mean, do you give it to Gus Bradley? I think so. He he, he coached before. Yeah, that's true. He has, and he's coached in the division. Yeah, he's it was a head coach at Jacksonville. Jacksonville. So I mean, there is that, but the Colts also aren't a team to make a move like that in the middle of the season. But I feel like. If there was ever a time for Ursay to do that, it is this year because he's had those those meetings in his office with those with Ballard and Reich where he has just lit into them last year and again this year already. I think it's a I think he, it's a fuse that's waiting to go off. But I think if they lose lose these next two games, I could see that move happening going into that game against Washington. If not at the bye week but at the, by that point it's like why make the move then yeah. if it's so late in the season just hold on get through it and after that monday following you know black monday it's that's the monday it all it all goes down typically so wait you can always wait till black monday yeah, I think that's that's what will happen. So we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't decide which I would rather see more because I do want to see something happen. But I also, if we can salvage the season, I'd like to see that too. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what yeah, the Colts I, are able I, to I don't, do. I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of the midseason firing because, like, what does it accomplish? What what does it accomplish that you couldn't have waited until Black Monday for? Uh, I, I mean, yes, but I think it also sends the message of – like okay f- like because i mean i i don't know because i guess anything can still happen like i mean because even if you lose these next two games like you're truly out of it but maybe if you rally you can still make a wild card spot like i i don't know it, it's it's tough because i it does send it i think a solid message especially after what we've seen that like people are finally getting held accountable but at the same time you know you're right i mean you don't want to 
you know, kind of send that message, <laughs> like, you know, before you've even reached the midpoint of the season, then what's, you know, what are we playing for at that point? We've already kind of invested in and, you know, so I don't know. I think there's a case that could be made both ways. Yeah. I mean, cause we all knew that season that, um, you know, the suck for luck year, we didn't make a move in the middle of the season that year. I don't think we didn't let Jim Caldwell go. No, at that point. No, we waited till the end of the season. So, like I said, I I don't under I've never understood why. I mean, unless you think it's early enough in the season, and this new coach, this new interim coach, can light a fire underneath the guys and get them going. But I never understood it because it's not like this interim coach is going to come in and put in a new system, (laughs) and it's just all of a sudden going to magically work. It's I don't know. I think I think it does just kind of get you in the mindset. It gets the organization in the mindset of like, okay, we're going to start. We can start looking now as opposed to, you know, waiting until right. that that person is gone to. Yeah. To, so you can get that. So, yeah, there's a case to be made both ways, but we'll see. These next couple of weeks are going to be very interesting. Um, and and that, hey, if, if things do go south, that's always that's always – when things go south with the Colts, it's it is kind of nice at the same time because if you're on a budget and you actually want to go see a Colts game, tickets on the secondary market become stupid cheap, <laughs> and you can get really good seats for like next to nothing yeah. or like really affordable. Affordable the affordability goes up, so you can actually attend a Colts game. Yeah, because that year that the suck for luck year, I think I went to three games. <laughs> And like and sat with really really good seats because the price right. was it, you know and I, at that time I was a col- I, we were in college so I was able to afford you know not great but hey we didn't care that we were going to watch the Colts lose we just had fun at the Colts game right so there's a bright side to it oh yeah there there's uh, there is a silver lining that's for sure. <laughs>